want answers, I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Put the kids to bed. Turn down the lights. Close the door. Now, buckle in and open your mind for the Roundtable Podcast with your hosts, Shogun and Rhodesian. Hello and welcome to the Roundtable Podcast. I am Shogun. Thank you to the live audience for joining us and for Machina for recording. Uh, please join us on the Roundtable Discord server. You can find us through the conspiracy section of Discord or just Google Roundtable Discord server. You can also find us on all social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, Periscope, Tumblr, Reddit, you name it. Um, but most of all, join us on the server. So today we have a very special guest, an old friend of mine and good friend of mine, dreamly resident VIP, um, a Jewish gentleman from Israel, uh, a religious man, a mystic of sorts, interested in Kabbalah, the Torah, and also on the ground in Israel. So we have lots we can learn from Dreamly today. Welcome, my friend. How are you, sir? Um, uh, thank you, Shogun. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Got to be a little bit uh, honest and upfront. I'm really tired, but I will try to do my best uh, to energize this um, this podcast tonight and uh, and hopefully answer all your questions in a, in a satisfying manner and, you know, just hope it will be a productive podcast. Uh, and again, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And we could do a recurring series. I'm sure there's, I mean, me and you have talked many times, so I know already there's so much we could talk about, so much we have talked about in the past, we could revisit, etc. So first of all, just tell us about yourself. Uh, you were born and raised in Israel. What part of Israel do you live in? And what, what do you want to tell us about, you know, how and where you live? Uh, well, actually, I was, I was born in the States, uh, but uh, we moved to Israel when I was less than a year old. So you could say that I was born and raised in Israel. I, I live in central Israel. Uh, in an area that is mostly secular and liberal, even though I myself, I consider myself orthodox. Uh, even though I have not been orthodox my whole life, I grew up uh, secular, almost, almost an atheist. There was some kind of a belief in God in our family, but nothing more... And nothing, and not nothing really deep or substantial. It was just really a generic kind of belief in God. Um, well, you know, like many people in our generation, I was exposed to all sort of uh, conspiracy theories, and really, out of those theories, I've kind of rediscovered my my faith in God, and I have found myself wandering through many systems of belief, many ideas, many ideologies, exploring until I found myself most at home, at home in Judaism, specifically Orthodox Judaism. And this is the kind of, this is the kind of philosophy and ideology that I want to pursue uh, spiritually as well as politically, I would say. And well, tomorrow is actually a really interesting day. We, we're going to have our third consecutive election day because the, the last times, uh, because we have a, parliament, a parliamentary system, uh, neither bloc was able to, to get a, a majority coalition. So it tells you really how divided the people of Israel are. It's like, if I have to, summarize and simplify what the election are about it's really about being a sort of a liberal atheistic secular country or more of a conservative traditionalist jewish country this is what it is really about and i've been um i've been busying myself actually with the elections trying to engage in twitter wars because i find it really important and um well, yeah, that's basically it. I think I'm basically rambling on right now. So, yeah, I hope that answered your question. And yeah, yeah. that's great. Uh, so we should cover the election if we happen to catch you the day before a big Israeli election. Um, can you tell us about who the main candidates are, like the leadership, um, and who seems to be winning, or who you think should win, will win, and who you think should win, et cetera? Just 
give us your commentary on this election. Oh, that is really complicated. So, main, so mainly the two big contenders are from the right side, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. I guess you're all familiar with him. Some would call him a, a New World Order stooge. Um, and on the other side, there is Benny Gantz. He has been um, the chief of staff of the Israeli military in the past. And Benny Gantz represents the the left liberal bloc. And, and Benjamin Netanyahu obviously represents the opposite. As for how it's going, I think it's pretty much even, pretty much even. There are 120 seats in the Israeli parliament. I would not be surprised if by tomorrow, if in 24 hours, we will learn that Bibi got 60 seats and Benjamin at, and, and the other one, Benny Gantz, got 60 seats. That is how close it is. Um, but I'm also really worried because if I have to use my intuition, I think the left is going to win by one seat because it has all the power of the media, of the judicial system, of there are so many, so many funds and organizations in Israel today that are funded mainly by the EU and by people like George Soros, of all people, who support the leftist side. There has been so many, not not so many, but like one major right wing um, right wing party that has just switched to being on, on, on the leftist side. And you know, people in Israel who are sort of like truth seekers and are not brainwashed by the media, they realize it is because the, the head of that party is being bribed or or pressured to join the leftist side because they have to skew how the political map. Because really, if I have to be honest, when it comes to the Jewish population of Israel, the right side, the or the traditionalist conservative side has an overwhelming majority. So they have to use this the, this rearrangement of the political map. They have to use the votes of the Israeli Arabs, uh, even though yes, we live in a democracy and and Arabs and Israeli Arabs have the right to vote and they can vote whoever they want. It it, it still says a lot when if looking at the general Jewish population, the 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 right wing side wins by a long shot. So as for tomorrow. It's like I, I'm really afraid that they will win because of because they could uh, engage in in voting fraud, and no one, for a fact, in the media nor in the judicial systems would would even try and and and, and have a, an investigation on it. They really don't care. They're all working together. Uh, but yeah, this this is the situation. Okay, thank you. And let me know if I robot or if I drop out a robot, just carry on without me. Am I coming through clear right now? You are a little bit roboting, but I can understand. Okay, so now tell us a bit about Judaism in your life. I know it's an incredibly broad question, but, you know, what has been your experience of being Jewish in Israel? Like, from childhood, like anything you want to say, what has it meant to you? How does it change your life? It is incredibly hard to be a Jew, a practicing Jew in Israel. It's hard because, all, because you can imagine of all the things that I've told you that we're a liberal, um, secular society. And, and to be a good practicing Jew, you sort of have to uh, seclude yourself from any sinful temptations, which is practically impossible in, in a in a country such as modern Israel. So it is incredibly hard and and the media keeps saying that that the Israeli Orthodox are a bunch of leeches who, you know, don't don't aid the society when it's really not true when it comes to charity organizations, nobody comes close to the organizations of the Orthodox community. Um, 
so yeah it's incredibly hard but what it means to me it means a struggle it means i have hope to see meaning even even while i was an atheist because there was a time that i used to be an atheist even when i I was an atheist i had a feeling inside of me some sort of like a memory of past generations that, that, that lives that has lived inside me and kept telling me that there, there is truth to the myth of the Garden of Eden or to the myth of a golden age. Like in the ancient past, things used to be better. There is some sort of an archetypal fall to humanity. We were in a much better state in the past and now we have fallen from that, from that state. And, 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 and I have come to believe that Judaism is the way to restore that state back to the world, not only to Jews, that is a misconception, but to the entire world. Um, so I, I, I really do feel like my struggle is, is worth it. It's like King David in the Psalm, and I'm paraphrasing, and also translating while I'm paraphrasing. paraphrasing. He says, he says in the Psalms, "If I didn't believe in the goodness of the Lord, I wouldn't be able." Now, it, 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 it sounds a little bit silly, like wouldn't be able to what? So the general consensus is that saying that David writes. That if he didn't believe in like the promise of the restoration of the Garden of Eden to the earth, he would kill himself because of basically nihilism. I was like, I was like, why? Why should I lead these stiff-necked people with all this court intrigue of my own sons trying to murder me? Why should I go through all this? And and. If there is right. nihilism right. at the end, and this is like something that I relate to, and I think a lot of people relate to, even even if they're not Jewish, because this promise of a better future is echoed in pretty much all religions, and all religions are are are, are experiencing the same struggle. And a lot of people from from the entire world they can relate to these words of David. If they didn't, if they don't believe in a better future, might as might as well just put an end to it right now. And, but also I, I'm very, I'm very proud of Judaism and, and I don't want to sound condescending, but if people have a keen eye, if they have the eyes to see, they, they will have to admit that the world today is truly a mixture uh, of, of Judaic thought and Greco-Roman thought. Really, it's all it is. And, 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 and like a lot of the good stuff that people attribute to their societies, to their um, civilizations, these good stuff originate within Judaism, passed along through Christianity or through Islam or all the sort of um, derived Abrahamic cults. So I do take pride in it and I do see it as, as, as the Judaic influence that is slowly restoring the world to that promised state. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I'm sorry to have to ask. It's just... I can hear you perfectly fine. Okay. So, can you then tell, take us into then what Kabbalah means to you as opposed to Judaism or just in addition to Judaism? Um, Kabbalah... I couldn't really hear that. Kabbalah, the question was, what, what does Kabbalah mean to ah. me and, and in general in Judaism? Um, Kabbalah translated means handing over. It's like handing over in the form of tradition from one generation to the next. Receiving. Um, um, it, it means receiving. Receiving from the one who is handing over through down the generations. It is seen as mystical knowledge or the the secret teachings you know in, in masonry they call it the the esoteric teachings of masonry uh, in contrast to the exoteric it was like you have the 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 three blue degrees and then the more esoteric degrees even though i i, I 
reject masonry. I, I, I oppose masonry. It's like a secret reading of Kabbalah. And it is not secret because they want to keep people out. It is secret because it is actually quite revealed. If, if people read general Jewish writings, it is revealed, but it is the, the question is, can you understand it? Uh, so nobody's really trying to safeguard it because of the, of the mystical nature of it. Uh, they can only create it in allegories or in what seems to be a code, but it's not really a code. It's just the only way that a human being can convey mystical knowledge. And it requires this eureka moment, this insight moment for the human being to to understand what it really means. And, uh, and, and, and it is seen as the actual true science by which the world is operated. The true science by which the world was created. The true blueprint by which this paradise state in the future is to be modeled after. And and we hope that in time, as, as people really become open-minded and, and want to hear what Judaism has to say, that they will come to learn it and to live their lives accordingly. Even... Even, even I have the hope that maybe someday it will reach beyond be beyond the level of the individual, meaning not just individual people coming to learn Kabbalah and trying to live it out in their own lives. It's like it's good, but it's not what Kabbalah is talking about. Kabbalah would say that that for true t- change to happen, it has to happen on the collective scale, not the individual scale, meaning. And I know it's going to sound a little bit spooky to uh, people who believe in, in, in the Jewish conspiracy, right? Especially coupled with masonry. Kabbalah would say that that really collective civilizations, meaning the leaders of the civilization, have to completely remodel, essentially creating a new world, a new world order, a new world civilization according to the Kabbalistic blueprints, which we believe were handed down to us from God and from God to Moses and from Moses to to Israel in general, build the civilization according to that blueprint. And this will make paradise or the Garden of Eden manifest in the physical world once again. And this is what we have to do. But you can see that we can't do it now because there is a lot of of, of opposition, political opposition, religious opposition, ideological opposition, which shows us that 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 God is willing to give us the time to sort it out to sort it out without taking away our free choice until we alone come to accept that this is what is necessary to be done, and in the process of learning that this is what should be done. We are learning more about each other. We are learning to come together, especially take this podcast, for example. I might be the, the, the first time that people get to speak to an actual Orthodox Jew. But this process goes beyond me. It's like Discord, for example, it's just a tiny fraction of what's going on. But Discord, for example, how many people have talked to Muslims from from Muslim countries for the first time in their lives coming to learn that there is an actual flesh and blood person behind the monitor who speaks to you and you realize that you have sort of like the same goals in life. You both want to live in peace. You both want to enjoy life. And it's really, there's a lot of optimism to the process, but it is hard to see that process. And um, I know I didn't get too technical i spoke more in generalistic terms and and if people have any specific questions i would be happy to answer
Okay, so that sounds like a good opportunity to turn it over to open discussion. So if anyone wants to ask a question now or just say something about anything, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll keep asking. Nobody? All right. <clears throat> well, uh, tell me this then, uh, Dreamly. Do you think that uh, peace in the Middle East is getting closer or farther away? Is it is it uh, getting hotter or colder geopolitically? Both at the same time. Um, it's getting colder with nations such as Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Iran, but it's getting hotter with nations such as um, um, the 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 this the Arabic Peninsula, I mean Saudi Arabia and all the Gulf states. It's getting closer with them. Um, it, it it it's really it's like it's i'm i'm really curious to see how god would orchestrate this historical time to reach towards peace in the middle east may, may, maybe it will be this building up of peace and maybe it will be a complete chaos and war and after there is a there is a, a definite winner then there will be peace because the other side will capitulate <coughs> so I'm not a prophet. I can only speculate, and and this is this is how really uh, most of biblical prophecy is. The prophets knew, but we can only speculate as for the correct interpretation of what it is that they did know. So, as regards um, the Bible. What is your take on it? Is it how it taught you as a Jew? I know you studied some amount of this. Is it seen to be like revealed by God, is it inspired by God? Like, how did Jews understand the authenticity of the Torah? I think I understood your question, but you were pretty robotic this time around. So, if you could. Well, I'm sorry if I'm roboting. But my question was, do you believe that the Bible is, like, directly given by God in the way that Muslims believe the Quran was? Uh, if I understand correctly, Muslims believe that um, that God dictated the, the Quran to Muhammad word by word. We sort of believe that God dictated that God dictated the, the Bible to Moses and the prophets. But we also believe that there, that he gave them a lot of, of freedom to, um, to phrase it in their own words. Because there is uh, an example, I think, between Isaiah and a minor prophet. They both speak about the same prophecy, but they use different words. They phrase it differently. So we can understand that God showed them the same vision, but it chose to phrase the vision, to put it down into writing differently. Now, if I didn't believe that, you know, as the Christians say, the Bible is inspired, I wouldn't be a, an Orthodox Jew. Uh, it's it's practically impossible to be an Orthodox Jew who doesn't believe the Bible or or even some parts of the Bible are are not, are are not inspired. So, what are the practices of Orthodox Jewish life? Like, what what do you actually do in terms of your religion? Uh, what do we do? We mostly pray. We mostly pray. Uh, we do a little bit of. of <coughs> what could be perceived as practical magic in our prayers, meaning the wearing of the tefillin, phylacteries, the, those black cubes around our arms and our heads. Um, what really does it do magical-wise? I, I, I don't know. I can only speculate. Um, can you give us your speculation? Sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. It's sort of like really deep, but uh, I posted this picture to Shogun. Does it have anything to do with Saturn? 
the no or maybe the Jewish kabbalistic people. cube of uh, mecca I don't think Mecca has I mean, any relation. I wouldn't say it was a Kabbalistic cube, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, I didn't find anything in Jewish literature that, that that speaks about any relation between Saturn and 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 the Tefillin and those cubes. But mm-hmm. I can speculate that there is, because after all, Saturn is the seventh planet. It is just the, the, the planet of Saturday, and Saturday is the holiest is a holy day in Judaism. Um, what I've heard and what I've got it to, what what I understood is that the first thing that we do, if you look at the pictures, you will see that um we take a cube, put it around our left arm. This is the side of the feminine, the side of, of Gebra on the Kabbalistic tree. And we wrap the black leather seven times, like the seven days of creation, the seven lower sephirot. Um, and, and what the intention, at least Kabbalistic intentions, it was like most Jews would just do it without understanding what it is they're they are doing, but Kabbalists understand and they are putting their intention into it. And what they are intending is that with the wrapping of the, of the leather uh, cord around the left arm is that they are binding it as in bounding it. And, and the left arm, arm is seen as the, as the side of the feminine and as the side of the evil inclination. Not saying that feminine is evil, because there's also a deeper teaching that the evil inclination is a very good inclination that goes really deep. It takes a lot of time to understand this. And and I'm saying that there is no contradiction and how really beautiful it is. So they want to bound their evil inclination, uh, make it subject onto themselves. And then they put it, they put another one around their head. And what it does is that it, they intend on unifying the two brain hemispheres, as it says, on that day. No, and, and therefore, a man shall leave the house of his father and mother, and he shall cleave unto his wife, and they should become one flesh. The masculine hemisphere and the and the feminine ha- hemisphere coming together and becoming one. The middle brain. Now, this goes really deep into understanding that a part of the fall from paradise was the separation between the two sides of the human body, between the feminine and the masculine. I know a little bit of, 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 uh, of yoga and Hinduism, and they would call it the, these two sides, uh, Ida and Pingala, and they come together in the Kundalini. Uh, so we have sort of like the same teaching, and we have the left pillar, the right pillar, and they come together in the middle pillar. Ah, kind of like uh, like the Masons. Like the Masons, but of course, this should come as no surprise to you, because if anyone studies the origin of, of, of Masons, origins of Masons come from uh, Christian Kabbalah. Correct. Correct. Christian Kabbalah. Joel Bikin. Sorry, Joseph. sorry. Uh, There's writings yeah, back yeah. in about, about... Yeah, the Jesuits had a, had a big part in it, but Correct, but but it's a little bit even more more authentic, uh, genuine than that, because uh, when Kabbalah was starting to be revealed in Europe, it happened right next door to a really big Christian population. So obviously they would take interest in that. And because they do also come from a biblical uh, perspective, they would try to... uh, uh, cooperate Kabbalah into their own Christian faith, so, and this is what they did, and and it sort of evolved into masonry and a lot of of European magical secret societies. The um the, they also have discussions. I think uh, I think uh, you're breaking. Okay, up. so there's a um an interesting CFR discussion with the the older prime minister. Uh, a couple generations back, bald guy, but he was discussing how the, you know the the holy the the how the what the side right in in Israel too. So there's still a lot of uh, uh, 
what is it called? Christian links to it. And then Benjamin Net, yeah, there's a there's a evangelist. You're cutting in and out a bit, I think. Can you the leave and come back to the room? Oh, am I robotic? Just try yeah. coming, leaving, and coming back to the room. Hang on. Just exit and return. I, I think he is not on push to talk and his his voice is not registering. No? We can hear you. Are Go you? ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say that there's 60 million... NSA, are you, are you using push to talk? I, I am. Is something... Ha I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong. I'm... It's because your green circle, the highlight when you talk, it, it's like it turns off as if you remove push to talk. Well, I'm I'm on a new connection, so yeah, maybe that is a problem. I have three bar. Put your gain to automatic for push to talk. I don't use push to talk. Well, then, well, then that's the problem. The sen it's not sensitive enough, and it's not picking up your voice, so it's it's a. Return. Okay, sorry about that. Is I restarted Discord. Is this better? Uh, hopefully. I'm just going to be silent from here. I uh, never mind. Trimley, um, can you tell tell us about the time when you know you were a Christian or you became a Christian? How, like, the path that you had, you know, in your spiritual life. Oh, yeah. Um, so, as I was coming out of atheism, because this whole dealing with all this New World Order, Illuminati conspiracies, most of the information comes out from uh, Christian sources. So, you know, 90% of the videos out there on YouTube, during, especially during that time, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, uh, would tell you, well, it's the Antichrist, it's the Antichrist. So, so they, they sort of like, they're they preparing your mind to see this from a Christian point of view. And so, this, so there's al already a seed uh, that, that could grow into a, a Christian belief. And also, you know, part of this research was uh, to listen to like debates between uh, creationists and, and atheists. And I genuinely found the creationist uh, arguments more convincing, way more convincing than those of the atheists. And but also those creationists tended to be Christians, so they further grew that seed within me. Until one day, I was approached by um, a group in Israel, which is active also in North America, called Jews for Jesus. They are uh, a Baptist missionary organization that uh, that that is directed towards Jews and they propose messianic Judaism and I sort of like talk to them and you know eventually I professed my faith in Jesus Christ and accepted him to my heart as my Lord and Savior but really even from the beginning I had slight problems with it it's like I, I was given a translated copy of the New Testament into Hebrew, all right? And, and, and it's important that it was translated into Hebrew because it, by its translation, it was trying to style how, how, how it was written according to the style of the Hebrew Old Testament, the same sort of language, archaic language, as the style that the translators used to use, but chose to use. But but even with that style, as I was reading it, uh, there was a feeling inside me that says, "No, it, it doesn't belong. It smells different. It reads different. It gives me a different sensation than the Old Testament gives me." And this is something I know for a fact happens with Christians too. 
as they read the King James translation of the Old Testament and as they read the King James translation of the New Testament. They feel the same feeling, like the vibe, the atmosphere, the spirit that, that, that it exhumes is different. And, but I still believed, right? I still believed. And I remember there was this time when uh, I broke, I broke on the floor, crying my heart out. It was like saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, we, your brothers, uh, meaning t me talking to Jesus, have rejected you. No wonder we suffer so much because we have rejected you. And I was genuinely trying to convert my friends. I would bring to them all those uh, um, proof texts that I was taught by Christians. And they said, no, nah, no, nah, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Now, they didn't have like any special knowledge of the Bible. They just refused to accept it. And until they told me, well, go talk to a rabbi. And I did. And that's when it started breaking down. That's when I was, I was shown that these proof texts are nothing but fluff. They don't say what Christianity wants them to say. And then it didn't just break into Christianity being um, just a false religion. It broke into Christianity being the nemesis uh, of, of Judaism. Uh, Christianity is some ploy, evil ploy to destroy Judaism. But out of the struggle between Christianity and Judaism, the, the salvation would come. Because... As much as those creationists and those conspiracy videos have planted the seed of, of Christianity in me, Christianity plants the seed of Judaism among within the entire Christian world. And Islam does the same for Muslims. And as as the struggle continues as, as, and as the truth be, is being revealed over time, um, that seed grows. And I believe this is what will bring this new world order. But of course, I don't mean new world order in the sense that we hear about in the in the conspiracy videos, not this Illuminati new world order. Um, but we all believe all Abrahamic, uh, all the Abraham the Abrahamic uh, believers believe that there will be a new world order. When Jesus comes, there will be a new world order. When the Mahdi comes, there will be a new world order. When Mashiach comes, there will be a new world order. This is what we all believe. I mean, if if you believe in any of the Abrahamic faiths. Um, so yeah, this is this is what sort of my my journey with Christianity. Wow, wow. Does anyone else have a question for Dreamly? Or if not, I, I certainly could ask more. Yeah, I'll, uh, uh, I'll let you go um, forward with one more question. So, Dreamly, uh, you also, if I'm not wrong, believe that the Earth is not, like, spherical. So, can you elaborate on that, if, if you don't mind? I am leaning towards it. I am not, like, 100% believing in the flat Earth, but I am certainly leaning towards it, and it is a little bit because of the Bible, a little bit because of Judaism, but mostly just because of this... Uh, new Earth movement on the internet. It's debate between the, those who believe in the sphere and those who believe in the flat Earth and all the the uh, scientific, or some some would say pseudo scientific, but I believe that there is science to it. Arguments that go back and forth, and that is and it, and it has made me and it has pushed me to lean towards the flat Earth. So, do you believe in it? Why? Like, what convinced you? Sorry? What, uh, what, what convinced you? Like, is there, like, a certain evidence that you're like, whoa, uh oh, maybe there is a splat? I'm trying to think of, of the, the, there are many sort of evidence, but I'm trying to think of the best one. All right, I'll break it into four or three points. 
if I lose count, don't laugh. The first one already coming out from a conspiracy mindset uh, perspective, the mainstream lies, mainstream academia lies, mainstream science lies, NASA lies. I mean, I, I don't think most of you believe that NASA landed on the moon. Um, secondly, uh, learning the science of, of the geocentricity versus the heliocentricity of the earth. And I am truly convinced, and I'm not leaning on this, I'm truly convinced that the earth is stationary, that we are not moving. It is the, 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 the heavens that, that, that circle around us. All right? And because of pure science. And, and then there are those uh, little tidbits of information that, that suggest that the earth is not a sphere. All the we see too far kind of uh, kind of experiments, uh, laser tests being conducted, uh, sheep being brought back into view. Um, yeah, I mean, if you are familiar with the flat Earth movement, even a little bit, then you, you certainly know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, I've studied the Flat Earth Conspiracy Theory, um, Mark Sargent, Under the Dome, Flat Earth Clues, Eric Dubé, 200 Proofs of a Flat Earth, etc. So I've been down that rabbit hole. And you and I both talked to Grizzly a lot, and he talked about Flat Earth all the time. I mean, yeah, I had a over at uh, another channel that some of us used to be a member, members of some time ago. <laughs> um, um, I had a recent discussion slash debate with a bunch of, of of globe believers, and well, it's really hard being the only one lean, leaning or at least defending the flat Earth uh, point uh, against five or six uh, people who believe in the globe. But yeah, there were so many questions that they weren't able to answer, and all they could do is just change the topic, change the subject, talk about other things. For example, there is no answer to how can there be a vacuum next next to an atmosphere? How can we have an atmosphere next to 14 billion light years across worth of vacuum? It's impossible. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely leaning gravity flat earth. A special where I, I think we are a special creation and this jives world me with my biblical perspective we are indeed a special creation hmm so do you, what's your explanation of gravity <laughs> that's my explanation of gravity or it can... Or your non-explanation of gravity. Let's whatever you think, pulling things downward. I am. I am not. I'm definitely not a scientist. I am not one of those top people on YouTube who know everything there is to know, or the cutting edge of the information about flat Earth. But from what I did manage to follow, is like there is a general theory about it's just a matter of buoyancy and density. Dense things will fall until they hit something denser than 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 themselves, and and lighter things will rise until they they reach a level that is lighter than themselves. This is how uh, things are seem to be organized where we live. But also, there is now a different sort of uh, new theory among flat earthers that look. I'm I'm definitely not the one to to explain it, but it's more of like has to do with electromagnetic forces that give this this initial bias of a downward motions. But ah, the infinite acceleration theory. I don't know what it's called. To maintain momentum or inertia, it would I mean, or to it would it would uh it would match if 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 we if a, if a disc was moving upwards. Just like in a car, eventually 
think it was, things would just start flying off because <laughs> they would match inertia. They would match momentum. So it would be like no more gravity. It would have to constantly speed up for that to be correct, I think. Yeah, maybe, I guess. I, I told you I'm not an expert, right? I'm not, I'm yeah. not third with, with gravity. Well, We're not going to get too much. Is, is just that the Earth is, you know, huge and dense. Therefore, things stick to it. I don't think we're going to get too deep into flat Earth right now because we're probably going to do a flat Earth event. Uh, if you could close your mic, Abundant, there's been a bit of mic noise. Just keep your mic closed until you're ready to speak. Thank you. Um, we'll do a flat Earth event very soon, um, recorded podcast. So for now, Dreamly, what, is there other areas you want to talk about? I mean, you want to talk about the Torah, Israel, Judaism, Kabbalah, some other thing? Like, what, what's on your mind these days? Um, I, I have to apologize, but there is nothing that comes to my mind. That's okay. As long as you, as long as you guys keep asking questions, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. So I how about a, this one? I uh, I'll, I'll just go on real quick. Sorry, Mac. Oh, go ahead, Mac. Go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I was gonna ask, Dreamly. You remember? I remember a long time ago we were having this discussion about sacrifice and how that like relates to religion and how it makes sense. And then you also, you brought up this, this song, this Jewish song, um, this killed that, that killed that, and that killed that. I, was, I forgot what it was called, but um, it was like this chain of events, you know, where like one thing killed another thing, and then, you know, it just went all the way till like God killed, you know, that, the final, you know, the end of the line. So, um, yeah, could you elaborate on that, please? So generally... Judaism believes in karma. There is it's just a rule of thumb. Judaism believes in karma. You do bad, you receive bad. You do good, you, you receive good. But sadly, we live in a world where people... Look, look creation needs, has a need to have sustenance. Doesn't matter what type of sustenance. Monetary, pleasure, food, spiritual, spiritual, whatever it is. Just in general, sustenance. And we, because of how we live our lives, we tend to take rather than receive. Right? And, and most often than not, we take without permission. We take by force. We compete. We step over each other for that sustenance, whatever it may be. And really in, in the high, in the eyes of heaven in the eyes of karma this is kind of akin to theft you, you take what wasn't yours so in order to make justice somebody will have to take from you but the somebody who takes from you we don't consider him an angel coming you know from god to prescribe justice we just see him as another asshole who chose out of his own free will to take for himself god just arranged it so that a thief will steal from a thief but the second thief will also be uh, stolen from so there is this cycle that we 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 somebody steals sustenance from us so we compensate by stealing from another however so we create this cycle of you know dog eat dog kind of world in order to receive this sustenance and survive we can break this cycle with instead of of taking giving giving charity for example it's like just think about this for a moment how long how influential can charity be Right, uh, as you follow the butterfly effect and as the domino falls, you just, I don't know, you give food to a homeless person, right? This homeless person has now sustenance and energy to survive for another day. 
where he can go and and, and you can only imagine what sort of actions he can take and can do in those in the in this one day that you had given him and how and how it would influence the world down the line but then as you were giving the food to the to the homeless you were watched by someone and perhaps you were inspired a person to do the same and now you create this cycle of giving instead of taking so but still sadly we're living more in a world of 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 cycles that are taken rather than cycles of giving and and sacrifice has like the idea of of nibbing it in the butt was like there is a, a negative karmic cycle that has now started the the, the the mystics behind the sacrificial system would say that now these um, sheep or animal that is being sacrificed, it is not randomly chosen. I mean, it is randomly chosen, but there is divine providence in everything. It's really, uh, the path birds take to f- the, uh, the path birds fly. The the way leaves fall uh, off a tree. It's all by divine providence. So the divine providence that is guiding this random choice to choose a specific sheep that in in past incarnations, and yeah, we also believe in, in incarnations, has pro- probably did something bad. And, and this is how we pay for the negative karmic cycle. We, we nip it in the bud. And not only are we uh, are we atoned for but also that sheep because god chose to uh, send this sheep in reincarnation so it would merit yeah i use the word merit to serve as a sacrifice and thus rectify for its crime whatever it may be in past life this is like the story of job if you read job job did not sin so why why was he punished so severely because god just wanted to have a bet with the devil no because job was a sinner in past life he uh kabbalah says that he was the the father of abraham the father of abraham was an idolater he was one of the biggest idolaters in babylon and now he reincarnated his job and he as as, as job and he and he paid for what he did he sacrificed with his flesh and today because we have no temple because we have no sacrificial system we pay by suffering suffer the suffering atones there's no question about it we all suffer and 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 by your suffering you atone now Perhaps Sorry. I didn't ask you a question. I sought to give more information that 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 was uh, that was given last time we spoke about it. So if there's like anything specific that you want, please tell me. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say that if that's the case, then you 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 would believe that if sacrificing resumed, that the suffering would reduce essentially because it's you know reducing this karmic debt, I guess, and nipping it in the bud. So. Do you think that Israel would be better if there was, you know, if they if they went back to sacrificing um, sheep? It it is a promise that in the messianic age the temples the sacrificial system will resume. It is it is in the prophecies, so there is no question that the Bible attributes the resumption of of the sacrificial system to the the betterment uh, of, of the entire world. I see, I see. There's one last question I had, and that was, it's, a, it's a, related to the K- Kabbalah and uh, the story of creation. I remember a long time ago you were explaining something about there's infinite space and then it's trying to pick up, like there's no space in infinite space. or There was something you were saying about how nothingness, infinity, and all that stuff works together. So can you just please... Tell us 
what you believe. All right. Um, Shogun, can you post that picture I sent you? Hey, Shogun. Uh, I'll just do it myself. Shogun has left the building. All right, Shogun so has left if, the if building. you go to the recorded Israel Judaism uh, chat, you will see that I posted a picture. Do you see it? Uh, uh, you will see that picture all over. You know, if you type in Google Kabbalah, you see that picture a lot in, in the images section. So those concentric circles, the first circle, the, the outermost circle, it says or and self, infinite light. Now that light is essentially the essence of God. It is infinite. So you have to imagine that it fills the entire page, right? The entire page is this white, this whiteness of the infinite light. And it is infinite in all directions. Also, this light is, is conscious. It is, it is consciousness. It is thinking. It is the thought, right? So now you have to ask yourself, what can it do? It's like, if you are just pure thought without body, right? What can you do? You can think, right? But, but what can you think about? All right, let's play a game. Just throw anything, anything that comes to mind. What can it do? <clears throat> Correct. It is thought, so it can think. What can it think about? Just throw anything that comes to mind. Perfect. Like literally Perfect. anything and everything. It makes it infinite, unlimited. All right, so it, but, but if it thinks about everything... It is essentially thinking about one thing itself, because at that stage, there is only itself. That infinite light is the everything at that present moment. There is nothing else. But wouldn't that mean if it can only think of a single thought, would that not be non omnipotent? All right. So you, you, you wanted to think of, 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 of something else, fine. Um, what do you want it to think of? Well, I was just asking, because you said if, you know, this divine light, you know, you said, think, think, of, think of a thought. First thing came to my mind, purple. Purple, and, all right. So, so, so it thinks about purple. It thinks about purple. All right. Now, a thought about purple in an infinite sea of thought would be crushed by the infinite thought. Think about it as water, all right? If you put something in water, all right, right something rigid, you displace water. So in, order to, in, so in order to think about something else and insert it within this sea of thought, all right, by now you have to understand that I'm speaking about in a mystical language. It was like, mm, I'm hearing you. All right, so you, you would have to displace, but can you displace infinity? Well, of course not. There'd be nothing Correct. to displace. Correct. You cannot displace it. It, it would be like trying to put a balloon in, in the middle of the ocean. You cannot displace enough water to put a balloon in the middle of the ocean. The, the, the ocean would crush the balloon. And 
but there is something that God can do, that this light can do. And it is to think about not itself, to think about what is not everything. Because it is everything at that present moment. So what is not everything? I'm genuinely asking you. What is not everything? Yeah. Well, it would have to be a something. Matter? I mean, matter can't be everything unless it's all matter. I'm not sure what you're asking. I mean, so, if something is not everything, clearly it's nothing, because nothing would be not a something. <laughs> this is getting very Alice in Wonderlandy, real quick. We are looking through the looking glass, and not only that, we are stepping through it, folks. Correct, Abundant. You got, you got the right answer. Nothing. Because if it is everything, the only thing at that present moment that is not everything is surely nothing. No thing. So this is why God says, there is nothing but me. There is none but me. I am alone and there is none else. I am the first and I am the last. There is nine besides me. It is the very first viable thought that God could think of. This is why Isaiah 45, 19, I think, says, I have formed light and created darkness. Genesis doesn't tell us that God created darkness. But Isaiah does. And this is how it was created. The something that is everything, i.e. the essence of God, the consciousness of God, thought about nothing. And because it is the thought, the thought about nothing appeared within the thought. A bubble of N-O-T-H-I-N-G, no-thing, appeared within the everything. And surely such a thought displaces nothing. It can't survive. So this is the first black circle in this diagram that I posted. So this would be Ein. This would be Ein. I have a question um, to pose kind of <clears throat> to you, Dreaming. I wanted to know what the, the Jewish take on it is because I understand the scripture says that God is the first and he is the last, but Historically, we can see that Judaism began springing up like the original scriptures um, were about 1500 to 1400 BCE, but there was still Hinduism and Zoroastrianism that predate that. Does Judaism have any explanation for that that you're aware of? Yeah, an, an easy explanation. I mean, you would probably not believe it because I can also I can already understand the way you think, not trying to sound condescending, but. The explanation is that um, the truth of God that Judaism is now re revealing already existed from, from the beginning. But because of the fall of Adam and Eve, it was forgotten. It only survived in some parts within um, the sons of Adam, the righteous sons of Adam, uh, Noah, um, Shem, etc., but it was sort of like unknown to the general population. They quickly reverted into worshipping the objects of creation, into worshipping uh, principalities of nature, worshipping the wind, the, the fire, the stars, the sun, the moon, because they forgot about, about God. They, they, the tradition from Adam of God broke down until God revealed himself to Moses, and this tradition was... Uh, revealed again, and now it is here in the world for for all to learn. Now you don't have to believe it. This is what Orthodox Judaism believes. This is our explanation. I understand that, and I have one follow up question, so I don't derail too much on the main topic. But uh, what is Judaism explanation for micro and the theory of micro, uh, kind of the theory of evolution, where we're digging up fossils and finding micro and macro evolution kind of being displayed scientifically? What is Judaism's take on that? 
in relation to the topic, I think. Uh, Judaism has no explanation to it because when the time that the major Jewish literature was written, there was no any knowledge of, of fossils and of dinosaurs and of evolution. Uh, the only people with, with, with any opinion about it are, are like modern people who have to see how the newfound information, how does it correlate to the Bible? Right now, there are general theories, and it's basically the same theories as in the Christian world: creationism versus atheism. Like, could be an, a complete denial of, of of evolution. Say it is bunk science, and 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 debunk all those fossils and stuff. I personally, I subscribe to that camp. Uh, I I genuinely mostly reject most of the fossils, be, uh, believing they are frauds, uh, not real. Evolution, I feel evolution is a complete fraud and, 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 and pseudoscience at best. I may be wrong, all right? And then there are other people who try to reinterpret the Bible in a way that would suit this evolution, uh, evolutionary model, just as, you know, modern Christians do. So, yeah, modern Jews, modern rabbis would do the same, but I am part of the camp that might be in denial. I completely deny this ev- this evolutionary model. All right. Thank you for that. So, um, so we were saying that now was created the, the first circle, the first black circle, this no thing circle. Now, this is you can think about it as a womb, right? It is now. Mm. And do you see a line that goes down from the outermost light circle through all the concentric circles? Did you see that line going from up into the center? This is the, the male, the masculine in action fertilizing the womb uh. creating more circles of light within the initial darkness so the As outer circle says, would be would be the essence of god okay. and the inner circles would be if you see what is written these are the essentially womb. the sephirot the first one would be keter uh, um Chochma, Bina, Da'at, all the way down to Malchut, which is the world we live on. Live. And, and if you follow science, science is beginning to realize that essentially all matter is essentially condensed energy. And this is something that they have known for a couple of decades now. But now they are starting to realize that energy itself is condensed light. And so this the is the question. Can I? Inter- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I Go ahead, to um, so the Ein Sof Ur would be the father, and the Ein would be the mother. So the, the, this, this and, and yes, and the first circle would be the sun, the first light circle, meaning the the, the second from the top would be the the sun. This is and so essentially the, the Ein would be. On the on the Sephiroth, the Ein would be well. No, we're in Mal- so the Ein would be well. If if we're in Malkuth, what would what would represent Ein in the Sephiroth? In the Sephiroth, because clearly. Uh, Kether should be considered the Ein Sof Ur, I think. Right? Uh, there is another... No, there is another sch- schematic, another diagram that shows Ein Sof Ur above Kether. Okay. Um, so... And yeah, and, and the the second circle would be the second light circle would be the sun. This is the source of the Trinity. 
of both the trinity of the pagans and of the Christians. But this is the mistake they're making. They're attributing divinity to the no thing, the mother. Christians refer to it as the Holy Spirit, which sometimes they don't refer to it. They don't attribute, attribute to, to, it, to it feminine aspects. Sometimes they do attribute it feminine aspects, but definitely in, in the pagan world, it was defi- it is definitely feminine, father, mother, and son. But you can clearly see that in this system, how it is put, you cannot attribute defini- divinity to the no thing it, because it is no thing. How, how can it be divine, right? And, and you can't attribute the divinity to the son because it is separate from the father. It is essentially the word made flesh. But what this shows is that everything is the word made flesh. Everything. Correct. So... It's like, I, I am not more of a God than you. No, nobody is more of a God than anybody. We are all sons of God. That is correct. But neither of us are more God than the, the other. So the, the so it stands to reason that the only thing we can truly worship is God the Father who is still up there surrounding everything. In Kabbalah, it's called the, the one who surrounds all worlds. And world is olam, which comes from the word he'elem, which means occultation. This is the occultation, the, the, the no thing. It covers the light inside of it. It, 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 it hides it. And so this is essentially the, pro, the, the process of the condens- of a condensing of the light until you reach this material state that we are in. Um, also, another thing, the the no thing has the no thing can be uh, likened into Eve. Eve was brought was brought out of Adam, like the no thing was brought out with by the thought of God into being. Out of the male comes the female. It is repeated in Adam and Eve. Out of the male comes Eve. Another thing is, if you go into Google and you type right now, sperm cell fertilizing egg flash of light. There's a video, a couple of videos, where they used a telescopic, sorry, a microscopic a video camera to video the exact moment that a sperm cell fertilizes an egg. And there is a flash of light. Let there be light. This is what it is. It's the same process all over again. Oh, this well, is above, so below. Yeah. This is the matrix we are living in. And the thing that destroys this matrix, by the way, the thing that made us fall, is that the light inside of the no thing chooses to masturbate chooses to spill light not in a in a no thing womb that it that it acquires for its own but inside the womb that it is already in it's like us spilling our seed on the ground now is better <laughs> that that creates bugs and viruses in the matrix this creates the misery, the suffering, the 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 lack of 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 bounty. This what what creates scarcity. This is what creates separation between the masculine and the feminine. And it's all revealed here in this one diagram. So, uh, sorry, this might be a little intrusive, but for how long have you not? Uh spilled your seed so to speak I, uh, well I just did a couple of days ago. <laughs> it's not not that easy right not that easy at all hmm. not that easy at all we live in we have we are living in the same world of temptation as everybody else we're exposed to the same temptation and it, and it is hard and, and and one of the things I've understood about Kabbalah is that it would teach us how to build civilizations 
in which the temptation would be revealed, the temptation would be presented to us only in the time and place where it is permissible to, to act upon it. So it, so it would be okay to, to act on that temptation because it is in the correct place, the correct time, and in the correct manner. We are essentially creating an orchestrated dance where we dance and we just let life itself trigger and, and, and tease the correct steps out of us. It is really the secret of, in of initiation in all mystery cults. This is the secret of initiation. They create an orchestrated scene where they trigger the initiate to act in a certain way that they desire. And this is what Kabbalah teaches, but we have to do it on a, on a grand scale, global, well, not global, because I don't want to say flat, whatever, but on a world scale. That from the time we are born, perhaps up to eternity, because we will never die, we will be triggered to act and live inside by this very dance, just like animals are. Animals are, their instincts are triggered by ver the very nature around them. This is why they don't sin. Because everything they do is, in, is done in the right time and in the right place. Solomon says in, in Ecclesiastes, there is a time for everything under the heavens. This is what it is. And, and, and really, there, there are people... We're with you. We're have, listening. We're listening. And, and there are people who have experienced, and are among them, psychosis episodes. Complete insanity. But th there is something in common. People who have experienced psychosis episodes, they will tell you that they have felt, even though they may, maybe they don't know how to put it in words, they have felt this energies, this extrasensory information guiding them how to act, triggering them into action. There are a lot of people who overcome psychosis, and yet they still believe that the experience they had are meaningful, and they are not some delusions. So you believe they could be, uh, maybe uh, they're just, uh, their spiritual foundations are not correct, they've opened some doorways they shouldn't have, and maybe it could be a type of possession or oppression. I, be, I believe that they have opened themselves up, maybe by wrong methods, but they still open themselves up into um, energies that are all around us. They were, the, the, their mind became able to sense those energies, and those energies started guiding them in this dance all around us. So, it, and what's, your, what's your kind of describing? Good or bad, right? Good or bad. Uh, energies, good or right? Bad, yeah. Good or bad. Am I able to be heard now? I updated my Wi-Fi drive. Yes, you're here. Okay, well, so what you're kind of describing with these psychoses, uh, and if you notice what psi, the etymology of it is like the mind and things like that. So these, uh, I know you you want to attribute extraterrestrial entities to. Uh, demons or angels or something divine. They, these are the periods of time when they actually come and communicate with you. That's why they use drugs like LSD for mind control because when you're, what you're doing when you take these drugs or you, is forcing your mind into a type of psychosis that allows you to access and hear and view and see these things that these beings can, can do effectively using projection technology that's I, again I'm, I'm not trying to derail or, or say it's not true or anything i just that's my i have had an experience with with ets for several months and it describes this and when you're in a state of like, psychosis it's a lot more profound um, because they they induce these these types of settings they use drugs and and uh you know situations so i mean 
I, I, I see where the and where these mystics have gotten these ideas from in the histories, as it were, being that I've experienced this with these beings. Hey, NSA, did, did you, whenever you had those experiences, did you feel like your mind is making weird connections? So yes. fast. But 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 in a way that might makes complete sense. And and when and, and when a connection is made, you are triggered into action. It's like you don't even think about acting. You are triggered into it. You feel no. like you're dancing to music. The actions, no. The thought, yeah. So like thoughts were going you know, all over the place wild and stuff like that. Um because they were playing off of my thoughts that I would have about a thing. And then it would, it would continue that down the road. They would also project in movies as it were over my eyes so that they look like, you know, if you look at the blinds, it looks like there's, there was a special ops guy jumping out off the roof or like a fire truck driving by when it wasn't like, it was really visual, uh, you know, in, in inputs. They even put in a, a, they put in a person I knew not very well, by the way, they put in a hologram of him standing in my room and his face would light up red every time he spoke. And every time that I would think it's as if the thoughts were triggering the, the, this redness in this hologram that they were projecting in. Um, so whatever, and it, but it was a person. It wasn't, it was as if it were an avatar of a person because I believe they scan their bodies and counter mimic what these people that they target are. So I, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, it makes sense, but you know, we differ. I just believe that. Uh, by we are by still, the way, we're, I believe that we're still not ready to operate with these extrasensory information. This is why it is all very confused to us, and we really don't know what we're doing. I personally believe that it, it that it is meaningful, and that and that one day it will become a second nature to us to li to, to live according to those extrasensory information that is out there, but we just can't sense it. And I know that you believe this is just trickery of, of extraterrestrial beings. So by the way, they referred to this, this things that I saw, they referred to it specifically at, in, when they were in later in communication of these is he was witnessing the divine, so they know that they play off our ability, our interpretation of the divine to reference these things that they can do with their technology. So, um, you can take that as you will, but that's specifically how they work. Uh, that's oh. fine. That's fine. We, 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 we choose to see it differently. Um, <clears throat> another thing is that those... Another property that I wanted to say regarding the, the no thing, the feminine... Is that it's corrosive. It it, it 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 in a way, in a metaphorical way, it eats the 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 light that was put placed inside of it. This is the reason for because essentially everything in creation is essentially the God's light, God's word made into flesh, surrounded or rather wrapped with this membrane of no thing. Every cell in our bodies, everything, it's this. And, and, and this membrane feeds, it is in a Kabbalistic notion, it's called the klipa, a husk, a shell. A, a husk of a, of, a, of a fruit, the shell of a fruit, the skin of a fruit, gains its sustenance from the fruit. But, but, in, a, but, it, but in an harmonious, ideal situation, the, the the fruit feeds the skin the husk but the husk in turn protects the fruit in our situation because we have fallen the husk feeds off of us and attacks us at the same time uh, the, there's imbalance and and the way to overcome it is once you realize that God, the Father, the outermost light circle, is infinite, He can keep He can keep funneling more light, more sustenance into the inner or lower 
circles of light. He can keep feeding the endless hunger of the of the husks, but then there would be no decay, no aging, no disease, no death, because God keeps um, energizing the system endlessly, because he is infinite. He can do this infinitely. But we have to keep his commandments, meaning we have to live according to the real, natural, harmonious ways by by which we are to function in this system, in this matrix that we are. And this is what God says. If you follow my commandments, I will give you your rain in time. I will give you food. The, the, the land will, will give you fruit. Your animals will feed. You will be quiet. There will be no war. Um, this is it. It's all this. Once you understand this, you practically understood everything. Um, you go up this diagram uh, because this the, the light inside you cannot really be destroyed. You go up this diagram. And you are then judged by this slide because, again, this slide is not some inanimate natural force. No, it has will, it has consciousness, it has a sense of justice, and it judges you. It may judge you to heaven and it may judge you to hell. Um, but the way I understand it, uh, natural, the Kabbalistic way of understanding it, is that if you are just to heaven, if you are just judged, to heaven, it means that you will be reincarnated into relatively good life and and the lessons would be easy lessons. And if you are judged for hell, you would reincarnate into re relatively hard life where the lessons are, are difficult, somewhat painful. Uh, but essentially, we do believe that there will be an end to the cycle because history keeps progressing and there is a final point to history. Where, where, where the the truth is revealed once again, and the world is re restored to this paradise state, and then the dead will resurrect, and we will kind of live forever in this Garden of Eden that God has created for Himself to experience through us, His avatars. So here's the question, right? Uh, what must the individual human soul do? in order to be rectified with God and partake in the positive future that God ordains? Partaking in the future, you can really do nothing. No matter what you do, you will partake in this future. Because God is not going to throw sparks of himself into some, I don't know, mythical void or hell for eternity or destroy them. Uh, However, you can only, uh, with your free choice, you can only choose if you want to take an easy path or, an, or a hard path. This is what you can really do. And you choose, uh, you can choose going through the easy path by doing his commandments. And studying this, I know, I know that it is a difficult information to access, but thank God this information is now being uh, it, it is starting to be revealed because the world, the the, the psyche, the the consciousness of mankind is getting ready. People are asking for it, so they are receiving it, and it will only increase and it will become more widespread. People will understand this, and we will start seeking out more and more. And suddenly, Jews will start translating it for people, many, making it more readily accessible. And all we can do is just try and, 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 and aid this information being revealed and hasten the process, making the path easy. This is really what we can do. Is there anything else you wanted to cover uh, or that you want to touch on? Like, what is the situation of the whole Mashiach Third Temple situation? 
uh, I honestly don't know. It's like it seems like there's a a feeling within Orthodox circles that it is close, but that's basically it. It's like nobody knows how, when, who. Just a feeling that it's, it is close. I bet you that no Israelite during the Exodus knew that that it it would be Moses who would come. Nobody knew how he would come. Nobody knew how it would play out. God has his own ways. We can only trust that that he would, you know, fulfill his plan. I truly believe that he would do it. It is, in, it is inevitable. But we can't really know. And there are a lot of people who are speculating, saying he's, he's the Messiah. This is how it would play out. This is not how it would play out. But essentially, nobody knows. And can you comment on Jesus? Just how, what is your interpretation of the whole? Like, because, okay, this, all right. Now I want to get serious with you. It's uh, 652 CT. Are you ready to lock into an additional hour? Or do you need to go? I will try. Okay, well, even half an hour. So my question would be this, right? So you have this thing called the Torah, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Levitical priesthood, the the, the prophets, the, the judges, the kings, the laws, right? And then all of a sudden comes this Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Mashiach, uh, the Gospels, and the church, the early church. So what happened here? Like if if uh, Yahweh was like having a certain people for himself and a certain religion, what is this Christianity thing? Like, what does it mean from a Jewish point of view? Cause it obviously, I mean, in, in terms of pure numbers, it dwarfs Judaism in terms of significance, right? There's, I don't know how many Jews, probably hundreds of millions, perhaps, but billions of Christians. So probably what was this? Million Jews. 40 million Jews. Okay. 14, within billions 14. of, Okay, so four, 14 million Jews and probably 2 billion Christians. So what is this Christianity thing that took root in Judaism and completely overgrew it? It's the world choosing to go a hard path. That's what it is. I was like, I do believe Jesus is in the Torah and in the prophets, but not where Christians say he is, not in some messianic prophecies, but as but in hints regarding being the ultimate villain of history. And really, it, it is quite comical because I think it was brought about by... Um, well, some sects of Jews who had messianic tendencies, especially when in, in, in stressful times and desperate times during, you know, the wars with Rome. So there was already this messianic um, excitement in the air. And I think Rome, Rome capitalized on this excitement. And they created, in writing, a meme uh, a metaphorical, symbolical, allegorical meme that they presented to be as the king of Israel, as the Messiah, the savior, the fulfiller, the concluder, the one who concludes Judaism. But in, in but they gave it such a spin because they had the agenda to do it, to pacify it, to Hellenize it, to 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 make it comport with the Roman Empire that was subjugating Judea at the time. And I think it backfired on Rome. It's like, I think Rome only intended this psyop to work on the Jews because they had the intention of pacifying and Hellenizing the Jews who kept rebelling, specifically because of those messianic, of this messianic excitement in the air, because of this harsh monotheism that they believed in. Because of the complete distinction and 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 uh, what is the opposite of similarity uh, between Judaism and the and the Hellenistic world around it, 
And yet, at, during that time, conventional historians would tell you that that Judaism was really popular among the 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 Gentile people. It was seen as some exotic religion, really interesting, that really captivated their minds. And once they started hearing about this psyop, which they didn't know as a psyop, they saw it all. Oh, this is now my ticket into this religion, which I'm so captivated by. And it is an easy ticket to take. I can keep my Hellenistic ways, but now I am this, her quote, saved. I am made right with this God of this captivating people. And and, and it grew so large. And, and I think Rome tried to um to quell it at the beginning, but it caught on so fast, so rapidly, that eventually they gave up and Rome converted into the Vatican. I think this is what happened. And it kept growing and growing and growing. And yet I think the prophets knew that this meme, a Jesus meme, would come about. And if you know how to read it, how to read them, I think you would find this meme. But he is presented as a as, as a as a villain, not, not not as a good guy. But again, because it is the hard path, it is teaching the world. It is again Rome intended for Christianity, for the gospels, to Hellenize the Jews. But instead it had the opposite uh um, effect. It Judaized the Hellenists. It Judaizes the world. It plants those seed. Those seeds are growing. Where do we get the? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought. You were... uh, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Where do we get the interpretations of things like in Revelations of of the mystics will be burned and all this stuff and you know they talk about magicians and all this and mysticism. Where do we get that in in things like Revelations and how do you view that? How do you interpret that? And also, um, what is the synagogue of Satan discussion that people like to bring up pretty frequently? That's discussed in the Bible by was it by Christ himself that said these things? I, like, is he? Did he not? Because I know that there are some Judaic cult uh, segments rather that view uh, Christ as a as a false messiah. I know that that was something that was happening in the history throughout Rome and things like that. Uh, if you can comment on that, I think mainstream Judaism today still sees Jesus as a false messiah. It's not some sects. In the past, it's, it's the mainstream today. Okay. I, I I see Jesus as a false messiah, and um, um, as for Revelation, I don't know. You, 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 the way I choose to see it, the way I choose to interpret it, as as I see it, as people who don't believe their own story, and yet they are making up stories because they have an agenda to push. And I think they I had the agenda of pushing Jesus. Right, making sure it contains this Hellenistic principles. It contains sayings such as "render unto Caesar what is Caesar," because you know it wants you to be a good Roman citizen, a good Roman slave. And yeah, they they, they had to compete with people who were vying for the intention of people, vying over their hearts. So whoever had the agenda of pushing of pushing Christianity also had the agenda of delegitimizing people of other religions. Had had the the agenda to delegitimize druids or or miracle workers from pagan religions and from Judaism as well. It had the the agenda to delegitimize the Jews who who are trying to tell everybody, no, don't believe in this Jesus figure. He's not the Messiah. So they had to say, well, these Jews are are a den of vipers, synagogue of Satan. They had to because they had to delegitimize the opposition. So you think the whole concept of that, and well, what about the mystic thing? Like uh, they speak of magic in the in the Christian religion as not as works of the devil because you're communicating with demons to do it, as it were. In every case, like 
But then I hear Chabad mystics discussing how they can astral project to talk to God. Uh, are they talking to God? Are they talking to a, a false God? What are they talking? You know what I mean? Well, if I have the um, if I have the agenda to push a, a false religion for my own personal gain, and yet there are other people from other religions who perform miracles, right? I am vying for for the attention and for the belief of of people. So I would want those people to reject those mystics who can, you know, grab their attention by by works of magic and of miracles. I think this is what it is. It's try, it tries to condemn those ancient magi- magicians and miracle workers. So, so you know, the the sheep would follow the shepherd. It's just that I believe that Christianity is a full shepherd. So <clears throat> interesting. So many things we could talk about. But... So you and I remember dreamily early on, you walked me through all the Old Testament prophecies that Christians use to justify the Messiahhood of Christ. And you kind of walked me through the arguments of why they don't really apply. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, it was perhaps our first or second conversation that we ever had. Yeah, and it was very interesting, you know, because... This is the the paradox of Christianity. It's like the only fruit of Judaism is Christianity, in my opinion. I know that sounds like an offensive statement, but I'll kind of stand by it. But the problem is that Christianity, at least the way we've been given it, situates and roots itself in Judaism. So if you don't accept Judaism, then Christianity, as we've been given it, doesn't make any sense. But without Christianity, there's really nothing particularly redeeming about Judaism. And what I mean by that is, if you look at, like, the fun, we've talked about this before as well, Dreamly, but the fundamental problems I have with Judaism and the Torah and the Pentateuch comes from particularly the book of Leviticus. It's just most efficient to look only at the book of Leviticus. There's some really fucked up and evil shit in there. And I just don't believe that God would support this kind of fucked up and evil shit. And therefore, I have to conclude that these Pentateuch is not from God. But if the Pentateuch is not from God, then Christianity, Islam, and Judaism all kind of fall on their face at the outset. Can I can I also just say something real quick, just in the middle? You're comparing, you know, Christianity and Judaism here, but Christianity is actually far more savage in a, in, in a way when, it, when you think about it, it's actually because it contains hell, everlasting hell. Apparently, at least the Dreamless version of Judaism or whatever his belief is, because I don't, I don't really still understand it completely. Um, is not permanent hell, and he's, he said, "What was that? God's God will not condemn the sparks of himself into you know to oblivion or something like that." So yeah, uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, as for sure, and Luke, I, I think it's a matter of, of perspective and of opinion to think that. The, books like book of leviticus contain a lot of evil shit in it i can certainly understand why you say that because we have this new western modern western mentality and the type of morality that we have today in the modern western world it, it doesn't really you know comport comport well with the morality of, of the of the old testament but may, maybe maybe if one tries to study it and understand where it comes from and understand the the logical processes of it, you understand that it is even way, it is even more moral than the morality that we have today. Uh, but again, this is perhaps a matter of opinion. And as for uh, Machina, uh, the general consensus, general tradition among revealed, meaning what, what the general population of Judaism believes, is that when a person is, is condemned to hell, it only lasts, it can last up to a year. All right. But they say that it can last up to a year, but no, the actual, the maximum is, is 11 months. But sure, there are people who can even be condemned to far, 
a shorter time. And it's essentially some form of, of, the, of the Catholic purgatory. It was like, uh, it's, it's a place of cleansing the soul. And then it is taken out of, uh, taken out of hell. But once you understand Kabbalah, you understand that this too is an allegory. This too is, 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 is more, has more mystical depth than just plain, well, you're going to hell for the maximum sentence of 11 months. Um, and that is how I explained it, is you reincarnate. And it's like, you know, you can understand the symbolism behind uh, one lifetime being equivalent of one year, right? And so if if you have been naughty, then you are judged to reincarnate into a life that is relatively hard and painful, and and, and the lessons that 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 you would face are, are would be difficult, and not not pleasant. But again, it is only designed to to cleanse, to purify, to elevate. It is definitely not about punishment just for the sake of punishment. It is not for destruction of the soul and is not eternal. It is definitely temporary. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many directions I could take it, but I don't know how many hours we've been recording already or how long you guys want to go. I mean, I'm happy to keep going. I think maybe I could take one more question and then if you would want to turn it into a mini series, we could at some point. That would be great because, I mean, there's almost an infinite amount of stuff we could cover, you know, Torah, Gematria, end times, afterlife, you know, karma. Like, this is my, you've talked a million times. So, that being said, uh, does anyone want to take this last question? Otherwise, I will. Go for it. Okay, so just tell us this then, Dreamly. You believe that you are the chosen people of a particular god and that you have the scripture of a particular god and this god is the supreme god. So tell the people in this room and the audience of this podcast, what must they do? Like, what, what does God require of us? What, what shall we do or change? How shall we, you know, serve this Jewish or Hebrew or Israelite or Abrahamic god? Uh, it is quite simple. If you're hearing this and, and you know that you have Jewish heritage, meaning that your mother is Jewish, then according again to what I believe, you must absolutely must pursue, uh, uh, pursue a life of, 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 of Orthodox practicing Judaism. You, you are obligated by the virtue of you being born into a Jewish lineage. You are obligated to do it. Now, if you are not, you are obligated by you being born, by, by the virtue of you being born to lines descending from Noah, but not through Jacob, all right, to follow the seven Noahide laws. You're obligated to do so according to the Torah, right? according to what Judaism believes. Um, as long as you do this, this is essentially your, your air, air quotes being saved by the law. All right? This is what promises you being righteous. Essentially, perhaps, if, if what I'm saying is correct, ensuring you... Uh, an easier path. And also, now, I don't know if one is obligated to do this, but we can certainly understand, again, if you accept what I say, uh, how it is beneficial to promote this information, to search out for, for this Jewish truth. All right? But, you know, from sources that you can trust and and really checking and fact checking everything and making sure that you understand it and, and and not being shy to ask to try and go deeper and deeper 
and, and, and bring this light of knowledge and share it with the world because the world needs this knowledge. This is the knowledge that salvation of, of, of humanity as a whole, as, as a collective, as a, the entire world, this is what it depends on. So essentially two things, yeah. Follow the the, the laws, either the Mosaic law if you're a Jew or the Nor or the Noraic law if you're non Jew. And, and 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 do your best to share this knowledge. All right. Well, I wanna really thank you for uh, finally doing this episode. I've badgered you about it several times and I'm glad it finally happened. And I hope we can do a few more. We could get deeper into Kabbalah, Torah. Um, mysticism and a million other subjects but for now thank you Dreamly thank you Mac and uh, NSA uh, and the audience and reporters and again please do join us on the Roundtable Discord server through the conspiracy tag of Discord just search Roundtable Discord on Google find us on all social media Facebook, Periscope, Twitter, Twitch, Tumblr Reddit etc and we're also on GoFundMe and Patreon and we have a website and forum community so join up with us however you can, wherever you are. I think we even have a Minecraft server and shit now. So nevertheless, thanks, everybody. And uh, Dreamo, let's do another one soon. The rest of us, let's jump down to the roundtable chat. Who wants to stay and talk a bit more? <laughs>